Hi, um, I'm, my name is David McLaughlin and I'm an engineer on the compute team and for the last two years I've been working on Aurora. Um, what I want to talk about today is a system called Aurora Workflows. Um, this system is currently gaining adoption at Twitter um, and it's the result of kind of, I guess the, the subject of, the, of this talk will be more about how Aurora has scaled to the number of human users rather than the number of services or the number of uh, machines that it runs but more how it's grown as Twitter as a company has grown. Um, so one thing about Aurora adoption at, uh, at Twitter is you can go and download Mesos and Aurora on the Apache website today and it would be fairly similar to what we offered engineers when Aurora was ad uh, adopted, um, gained widespread adoption and replaced sort of physical hardware and that kind of thing. Um, the only thing we had to add uh, was this thing, uh, authentication. Um, so that you know we could protect different services, access controls, that kind of thing. Um, the quota manager, which is kind of like the building block for the chargeback uh, system that you just heard. Um, the quota manager itself is basically a way of saying here is a guaranteed resource that cannot be preempted, um, and that's kind of a, a crucial element of how we have almost free resource for development that gets preempted when there's something really important that needs to run. Um, we also have service discovery when you're running on dynamically allocated hosts, you can't just rely on DNS. So service discovery had to be a first class citizen here and also uh, a way to like, talk to these services if, if there's HTTP services running on Aurora, internal tools, um, we had to create a service proxy. Um, and uh, the Telepark guys actually open sourced their version of that called proxy. so um, that's now available for uh, other people as well. And finally stats, uh, visibility into not just the uh, the containers themselves, um, again, which feeds into the utilization systems. But um, application level stats, we have little sidecars that run next to your processes that export the stats to all of our observability systems. So yeah, this is what uh, uh, Aurora looks like. Um, there's a command line client that almost all of the interactions that users have with our system go through. There's a scheduler. Um, and the scheduler is basically uh, responsible for you tell Aurora, hey, I want to run these processes and I need this is what the shape of my instance have to look like. And then the Aurora scheduler negotiates with Mesos uh, to make that happen. So over time, uh, it became really important at Twitter that we had some way of sharing deploy utilities. Uh, it, it became increasingly obvious that every team that uh, ran their services on Aurora uh, were kind of creating the same tools and the same integrations with Twitter specific infrastructure. So what we came up with uh, is a thing called client hooks, uh, and they were essentially like entry points that ran before and after commands in the Aurora client, and we could bundle them with the client and share it to every engineer at Twitter. Uh, these were totally user controlled, so you could opt in and say, okay, I'm gonna enable the hooks for my service, or you could you know, disable them. So they were mostly uh, kind of not quality of service things, but it was more like notification hooks. So pinging the chat room and saying, hey, this deploy just started, or hey, this deploy just failed. Um, but one of the, uh, the important hooks was a watchdog hook that actually paused the deploy um, if your alerts started to fire. So this was kind of uh, a complement to the, the health checker system built into Aurora, which is more on the instance level. This was a higher level view that kind of paused the rollout if it was clear things were going wrong at the service layer. Um, but of course that's not enough um, to make it all completely user controlled. There was some points where we wanted to say, okay, we're going to have to uh, inject policy. So um, one, of the, one of my favorite incidents at Twitter was um, a user just decided, well not decided, they tried to kill one instance of all of their production services and instead they just killed them all. Um, so Twitter.com was down for a bit and of course uh, we were told you need to implement this. So command hooks were built in to commands and they ran every single time um, and prevented uh, anyone from ever killing anything that would take Twitter down. Um, but one problem is, as Twitter grew, um, we noticed, again, our customers started uh, writing more wrapper scripts around their processes, even around these hooks. And it's, it became an, an issue because the, the, the hooks themselves were kind of like the Wild West. We had some quality control for the shared hooks, um, but even then, it, it still kind of um, necessity trumped uh, a lot of uh, future planning. And what we ended up with, um, was interactive hooks, and interactive hooks are not great for automation. Um, it was another big problem where we have services here that could take several hours to deploy, um, and what would happen is the person uh, orchestrating that deploy 
because the client was you know, fat, they had to keep connection uh, to, to the scheduler and to the infrastructure that was being negotiated with, negotiated with in the hooks for the entire time of the deploy. So <laughs> one of the, uh, the, the complaints we got is I, I moved from the fifth floor to the sixth floor, lost my connection, and my deploy was cancelled. So that was not good. Um, so how we solved that was we created a thing called the Deploy Orchestration Service and basically took all of these hooks, all of the customizations, and moved it into a proxy layer between the client and the scheduler. Um, and this is where we first learned the importance of backwards comp compatibility, compatibility when you change anything about Deploy. Um, I think uh, if when we first launched this, we broke backwards compatibility and no one used it. So what we did is just we never told anyone um, that uh, that we had this proxy layer in, so they, they all became unintentional customers. So we got 100% adoption pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> so once we had solved that problem, again, we could start to be, uh, look at the other types of automation uh, and wrappers that people were adding. And rollbacks became like the, the biggest and most obvious pain point. So one of the problems with rollbacks um, is the Aurora commands themselves don't have referential transparency. And to try and explain what I mean by that is when you perform an update, the client accepts our DSL, um, a configuration file written in a DSL. And that DSL is evaluated to an immutable struct um, that runs on the scheduler. Now, because the struct runs on the scheduler, it's very important that that's immutable and consistent. Because if you're rescheduled and that struct was mutable or it, w it could be um, it could pull different resources in, then every time you're rescheduled, you might have you know, weird state in your cluster. So at Twitter in general, all of your job update requests are uh, consistent. But the service.aurora file, because that can, that, that can evaluate to a different job update request each time you run it, because the underlying resources changed, a user moved a pointer, um, you, we couldn't rely on things like s source control to do rollbacks. They couldn't just go, okay, I'm going to check out the branch where my service.aurora file, uh, ex uh, where the, ser the service.aurora file I supplied to my update start command when the, the server was in a good state, because it might evaluate to um, the, pre the current state or uh, a future state. So developers had no clear way to revert to previous configuration. What they wanted access to was the job update request, but all of their services are defined and our DSL. So what they ended up, uh, users ended up doing was they started annotating their packages with uh, a live flag. And that meant they had to go in and edit their file to roll back, they had to identify that version, and it just, it wasn't great. And this was kind of compounded by the fact that we have multiple Aurora clusters. So um, your service is very rarely just running on one cluster, it's running on multiple, so we have redundancy at the data center level. And so for service owners, it meant, you know, whatever your deploy process was for getting into production in one zone, you had to repeat it for all the zones at Twitter. And of course, there's already multiple release steps in any kind of like uh, production uh, deploy process. First, you deploy your, your service and you run tests on it. After that, you canary it in production first, and then finally, you roll it out to the entire cluster. And that's kind of the standard, uh, you know, like uh, anything that's involved in Twitter.com. So one of the, the, and as a customer of Aurora, I really uh, felt this was there's a high cognitive overhead to orchestrate all these steps. Sometimes you're canary, you want to say, okay, I'm going to leave that baked, for, uh, baking for like 24 hours. And then you come back to it, and the questions you have to ask is, okay, where, where was I in the process? What's the next command I have to run? And it, it was just a lot of mistakes were made, not from the, the, the software itself, but in the way that we were using these tools. And of course, rollbacks, when you have multiple clusters are even more painful because it's not just one cluster you have to, uh, one production cluster that you have to uh, revert, it's all of them. So what that led to was um, a piece of software we're writing called Aurora Workflows. And what that does is it allows users to define all the release steps to take their service from development to production. Um, and the key of this is the first step is you stage all of your uh, reproducible deploys. Um, and then, you end, that's the end of the, the command line interface. Um, you then release each stage via an API or UI. We support basic ordering to, to enforce and support uh, pipelines like test, then canary, and then production. So this is kind of what uh, the workflow stage command looks like. 
Rather than pass the, the DSL file, you, you define a service.workflow that is uh, augmented, basically it's added to the, to the process that you don't have to modify your existing Aurora file at all. Um, you just define a workflow file. That will then evaluate and do this trans transition from the DSL to the, the immutable thrift struct for every step of your deploy. And rather than talk to the scheduler, we're just going to store it somewhere. And that means once it comes to actually rolling out your software, you talk to our service and then we talk to all of the schedulers at, at Twitter. So this was the first time where you could actually perform um, a kind of federated view of uh, Aurora schedulers at Twitter. So I'm just going to try and give a live demo. <laughs> Wish me luck. Oh, yeah. So the first one thing I want to show is um, this. this is a, a workflow file. So it's very simple. It, you point it. At, you get. You provide. Um, you provide a, 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 an Aurora file, um, and then you you provide a list of targets. And these targets are basically job keys that you would pass to the update start command that, that, that's kind of standard in Aurora. Um, you give it a row and a name, and otherwise, it's just a sequential list of your, your deploy steps. Um, and just in case, um, this is what um, an Aurora config file looks like. So um, it's just a list of processes, um, and then you templatize it to create these different uh, job keys with different environments, um, and you can templatize the clusters. So what it looks like for a user who's using this, um, is you run the workflow stage command, you point it at your workflow file, and it just goes through the config file, evaluates it, um, calculates the job update request, saves it, um, and then it opens this UI, where this is where you start to really interact with the deploy. So here you can see we have all of our four steps, um, and some of them aren't ready to be released yet, and this is um, kind of forcing the user to do the steps in, in, in the correct order. When you're ready to release, um, we have some features here, um, like live diffing. So this shows you, before you hit that button, exactly what you're about to change. Um, and that's uh, kind of a huge improvement over pure CLI interface, where you're just like, sometimes just taking a shot in the dark. Um, and then it's just as simple as clicking a button. Um, you click the button, and it should start. Um, and then, yeah, the release is in progress, and this just points to the Aurora scheduler page where the update um, will be orchestrated, and you know we've got delegated off, and all that kind of thing for proper auditing. Um, we can also interact with it, so you don't have to jump back and forth between the Aurora CLI and this tool to actually, you know, pause or abort things if you see them going wrong. Um, but bigger than that is, uh, you can see here, this is like a deploy history. So each time you stage a workflow, you get a monotonically increasing identifier that just kind of gives you like an easy way to establish history. Um, and you can see here, uh, you know, we color code it so that you can very quickly find the last good one. So if this one ends up bad and I want to roll back, I click on this one, okay, there's no actions I can take because it was aborted. But I go to the last green one and we have this button here that's just roll back to this version. So with a single click, it will stage a new workflow that basically recreates the steps and then it's just going to undo the deploy that's currently, that's currently running. Um, so yeah, I can go in, abort that, mark it's bad, and then I can you know, undo this. The one thing about um, rollbacks is that we allow you to do it in any order. We remove any constraints on the ordering because generally um, you want to roll back in the reverse order that you roll forward because um, the production targets are generally the most important. Um, that's pretty much, pretty much it for the UI. So let me just switch back here. So I had a couple of screenshots here in case that did not go well. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, I just want to conclude by saying, you know, I'm not trying to advertise this as a great deploy experience because um, right now in the Aurora team, we actually have the best deploy experience, which is I never have to do deploys. Um, I commit code, I write tests for that code, and it just magically finds its way into production because of some hard work that our SREs did. And that's the kind of deploy experience we want to give every engineer at Twitter. Right now, there's a, 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 there are some teams that have that experience, but they put in an incredible amount of effort into all integrating and writing tools. And we want to make sure that these people are not having to do this for every service of Twitter, but instead, you know, taking advantage of, you know, 
um, re reusable um, uh, tools. So yeah, this is the team that worked on this. Um, it, was really, it was a complete team effort. Um, and uh, these were some of the people that helped um, uh, get adoption of this uh, system at Twitter as well. So thanks, yeah, and if you have any questions. Uh, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yeah, N. <laughs> it's a few. And we have you know, multiple in, uh, in each data center, so we have some like isolated for our own testing, and our software has to run in all of them, so <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, Sean. How do you manage the deploy or orchestration service? We, that runs on Aurora, so we kind of dog food. Um, uh, workflows, it's deployed via workflow, so we, right now we just go to a CI job, click a button and it stages a workflow and then we have to manually go through it. Um, that's the part we want to make sure that it's almost like you want the Aurora update process to be the workflow update process where you just click a button start and it rolls through um, and automates that entire thing. So no one's clicking buttons, no one's running commands. <laughs> okay, so the question is, uh, what do we mean when we say authentication um, in Aurora? So that is literally just who has access to update services, to, to deploy to certain roles. So if you have revenue services, for example, you don't want anyone at the company being able to go in and just, you know, <laughs> tail credit cards or whatever. So um, yeah, we have like basic uh, ACLs in place. It's, it's LDAP and Kerberos um, is basically what we have. And the, the, the Apache project has very clear integration points at the client and at the scheduler level. Um, Plug that in. So yeah, that was uh thanks. <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> <laughs>